so just a quick review of what we've been up to. So I, we basically finished discussion of equ uh, equation of uh, motion. So just a brief review. So we have equation of continuity, which is essentially conservation of mass. So when we essentially do a shell balance over a simple volume element, we will actually get to, uh, in the standard procedure of doing the balance, both going in and out through the boundary, uh, and dividing by the uh, volume of this volume element, and then shrinking the element to a point you obtain a partial differential equation. And for equation of continuity, we know that d rho dt is equal to minus divergence of rho v. Again, divergence is collecting what's coming uh, through the boundaries in terms of uh, momentum density. Now, basically, we do the similar procedure for equation of motion. Okay, uh, It's just that now, uh, we will actually have a slightly different balance in terms of we have to actually account for the combined momentum as well as the action of any external forces. And this change is now actually going to be, uh, so we're not looking at change of mass, we're looking at change of momentum. That's a vector quantity, so the equation that we'll, we'll get is going to be a vector of equation. So most of the time we deal with such issues by looking uh, things at coordinate by coordinate. So if I look at the x momentum, this is essentially what monitors x momentum in terms of the combined uh, uh, momentum tensor. Those are phi x, x, phi y, x, and phi z, z, x. They describe how momentum crosses across x, y, and z planes. Okay. So basically, we will get this balance that is now divergence of this vector v x x v y x v z x okay and plus the action of the external body force okay so this is my x momentum i can write a similar equation for y and z okay so when i write all three of them this is what we get and then we simply define okay to make this a vector equation i'm going to define a divergence of a tensor and divergence of a tensor is a vector each coordinate of that vector is divergence of one of the vectors that constitute the tensor. Tensor can be viewed as three vectors, therefore I can define divergence of a tensor as a vector that has coordinates that are uh, divergence of each of these vectors. Okay? And then I can write my equation as a vector equation, so change of momentum or density, momentum density when I'm looking at a point is divergence of this tensor plus rho g. That's my equation of motion. Looks really simple. All of the complications come from actually writing what phi is. Okay? So when I actually write what phi is, I have to have the pressure part in there, I have to have the shear stress part in there, I have to have the uh, convective motion part in there. So basically when you write that out, this is what we get. And you will notice that I will often, in terms of notation, I will often forget the underlining of a tensor, simply because I uh, don't come from, I come from math, and in math you don't do that. <laughs> okay. uh, this is, this underlining the tensor is very common in civil engineering and linear elasticity, which is not my original course of study. In fluid mechanics, you don't often do that. Uh, but again, you will see me sometimes underline, sometimes not. This is a tensor nevertheless, okay? And these brackets around are again something that is typical in uh, BSL. So brackets indicate that the, the, the resulting thing is a vector, okay? So the object is a vector. So this is a vector, but if I have some sort of a complicated uh, operation here, then brackets around them mean that, okay, we actually have a vector here so that you don't have to necessarily think or that it reminds you that it's a vector quantity. So basically, divergence of a tensor is a vector, gradient of pressure, of course, is a vector, and again, divergence of this tensor, this is a tensor, if you recall, so divergence of this tensor is a vector as well. All right, so this is basically my equation of motion, and last time we went through definition of material derivative, and there was a lot of rolling 
of the eyes in the audience at whatever it is that I was doing. All that I was doing is that we had to go, go through a certain calculus in order to reconcile the fact that sometimes my coordinate system is static. So I have to account for things flowing fast by me. So not only that I'm <coughs> looking at the changing flowing, I'm also constantly looking at the different portion of the fluid because the one that I looked at a minute ago was, is already down the stream. And sometimes you also simply have the measurements made we maybe have tracers, we maybe we have actually measurements quite literally done on a boat. Okay? So my measurements might be flowing with my river or going at a different speed than the river if you actually have a motor on that boat and you're not just flo floating. Okay? So basically you have to reconcile in time and space what it is that you're measuring and where are you. Okay? So going back and forth can be kind of mentally a little challenging and the finisher materials that really helps with that. It also helps with recognizing simply that we have in this equation, when I put things in places, so basically when I put this in this term, calculus shows me that this is actually a material derivative, rho times material derivative of V. So that really just reminds me if I think of a differential version of mass times acceleration is equal to F, then it's density of mass times acceleration equals to forcing on the other side. So it's just to tell you that we actually haven't gone away from it, it's just that we, the equation of motion looks more complicated than MA is equal to F, simply because I have to account for all the things changing uh, while I actually have a static coordinate system. So that's something that is typically when I'm looking at a body or a bucket of something and I'm looking at mass times acceleration is equal to F, I don't have necessarily that problem. All right. So basically, uh, we will actually now uh, move to some special... Uh, oh, okay. Let's actually move to solving uh, problems because apparently I did not... I thought that I was a little ahead of the special cases. Uh, so we will move to solving problems today and I will outline the um, special cases uh, next time. So one of the most special cases is, uh, most common special cases is that of constant, uh, uh, constant rho and constant uh, viscosity. So basically if I have constant density and viscosity, my Equation of motion becomes a specialized equation of motion when I write all of the parts out. And today we will actually go through two examples solving using that Navier-Stokes formulation from your textbook. Okay? So first one, I'll actually just remind you. So we solved vertical tube. Um, so we solved for it already in shell balances. And now I will show you how to solve it using the Navier Stokes equation that is in the back of your book. Okay. So we will go through, I will go through it on the PowerPoint. Okay. And then after that, you're going to solve a different problem. I have a break worksheet for you today. So we'll actually apply the similar procedure to solve a problem of so-called Kuwait flow, which is in annulus and it's something that is rotating. So I have only velocity in V theta. So those, that's uh, basically our uh, solving the problems uh, for today. So let's go through vertical tube first. I will first remind you of what this was last time when we were doing the shell balances. We assumed steady state. Okay? We assumed that Vz is just Vz of R, and the other two velocities are zero. And then we did a z-momentum balance on this shell. Okay? When I did the z-momentum balance, we got that basically uh, this balance after sending delta z and delta r to zero, it actually becomes a partial differential equation in v z and v v r g, and I have the action of the outside forces, which is rho g. So then basically, so this is my outside uh, forces. Then basically, when I write down what phi z z, and phi rz r, this is the equation we get, and then we essentially solve uh, this equation 
uh, it helps a lot that z is not function v z is not a function of z, okay, and therefore a lot of the terms that we have in this first part disappear, and I'm only really left with the pressure, and that pressure goes on the other side, so I have that minus one over r d t r z d r is equal to uh, z derivative of what we call flow potential or generalized pressure, and when I solve that. Basically, uh, this side is a function of z, this side is a function of r, that can be resolved only if I have uh, constants. So basically, once I put that con those constants in, we can actually solve for my velocity profile, that is our famous parabolic profile. Okay. Now let's see how can we get this, hopefully the same result using equation of motion. Basically, we don't, now, now that I have equation of motion, I actually have a change in time. So technically, I don't have to assume steady state. In this particular case, we will, or otherwise, we will not come up with a closed solution. But if you were actually programming a, a simulator, then you could actually leave that time component in there, integrate in time, and actually get the solution both in time and space. And many of you will do some version of that in your research. Now, if I actually assume Vz is V or is Vz of Rc, let's be slightly more general, okay? And Vr and V theta is still zero, we can actually get rid of or show that Vz does not depend on Z using equation of a, a continuity. Because if I put divergence of V is equal to zero. This is divergence of V in cylindrical coordinates. Does everybody know where to find divergence in cylindrical coordinates in your textbook? Or appropriate appendix, okay? So get to know your appendix. Again, during the, so don't focus on memorizing these. Kind of be able to recognize them. So by now we already know that there's this one over R and RVR that is specific for cylindrical coordinates and accounts for the fact that my areas change with R as I'm moving away from the origin, okay? So know that, but don't focus on just memorizing, though some of these you might know by the end of it, but focus on knowing where they are, and during the test, I'm gonna give you a copy of the appendix. Okay, so you're gonna have those pages, no need to memorize them. Uh, so be just a smart user of the appendix. So these things, since vr and v theta is zero, okay, these two terms will disappear, and all I'm going to be left with is that partial vz is partial z is equal to zero. Therefore, essentially, vz has to be a function of r only in order to set, satisfy conservation of mass or equation of continuity. Okay. And that's the assumption we made up front during the shell balances without necessarily mentioning equation of continuity. So this approach is more general. Now, of course, the question becomes is what happens when I make assumptions and my assumptions are no good, okay? So if you make such assumption and you start solving, you might get a solution that makes no sense or you might contradict yourself somewhere in the solution. That typically so basically, if you get to something that like basically cannot be at the end of your solution, that means that A, maybe you just made a mistake on the way, B, your assumptions were not correct. So you have to go back to your assumption and see what you can actually realize. Okay. So that's something to, it's not that you shouldn't be making assumptions because assumptions are simplifying assumptions, otherwise you won't be able to come up with analytical solutions, but yes, here and there you will not make wrong assumptions, and then you have to go back. So this is Vz is Vz of R. So basically, it's the equation of continuity that gives us this um, dependence. And then when we apply equation of motion, okay, this is my equation of motion in its most general case. Okay. So this was basically my divergence of phi, as in combined Ten, uh, uh, combined uh, stress tensor, and this is my outside force. And basically, when I look at steady state, this will be zero because I will not have, I'm looking for a steady state solution, so I don't have time dependence. 
And second part is that I will actually put together this minus gradient of p plus rho g again as minus gradient of uppercase p where p is my flow potential and it has the same definition as we did during the shell balances. So this is just to make uh, things uh, simpler to write down. Okay. So this is now a vector equation and I actually go and have to solve it coordinate by coordinate. So I can look at its r, z, and theta coordinates, right? Okay. So you have two choices when you go through appendix. Again, you will use one or the other depending on what is being asked for. If I'm asking you for shear stress and to compute the shear stress, then you can use appendix A7 and then B1. So first you will solve for shear stress and then you solve for velocity distribution, both of these being vectors. Or you can go directly to appendix B6 if you have a book. We'll try to take a look at it right now. And you actually use Navier-Stokes equation, which is directly in terms of velocity distribution. So Navier-Stokes formulation will not have tau in there because tau assumes a very specific uh, formulation. So we'll do examples of both as we go through. So let's actually now, first time I actually skipped r and theta when we were doing shell balances, let's now look at all of it. So if for vertical tube, if I'm looking at the r equation, now my vector equation has these subscripts r, meaning that this is r component of this vector, okay? r component of this vector, r component of this vector, okay? And if I'm looking at the r component of divergence of tau according to a, appendix A7, this is what is our component. Now, in a lot of these problems, it's an exercise of writing down the full equation and then basically canceling most of the terms. And if you don't cancel, you should be concerned because you won't be able to solve. Okay. So there is an art of canceling. Okay. Tau R, R according to Appendix B1 is just simply this, so that has to be equal to zero, this first term, okay? Tau theta R is this, according to the full definition of tau theta R. Again, note that this is cylindrical coordinate system, so it will have some unusual terms in there. It's not just your partial v theta, partial r plus partial v r, partial theta, which is what we would expect based on the uh, Cartesian coordinate system. So in non-Cartesian coordinate systems, you're going to have these terms r and 1 over r. So this is zero as well, because again, v theta and v r are zero. So this term disappears as well. My tau theta theta, again, is depends on vr and v theta, so that has to be zero as well. So the only really term that survives in this entire medley is partial partial z tau zr is equal to zero. So what I'm really getting, that term can actually disappear as well because I don't have z dependence in my velocity at all. Okay. Therefore, all I'm getting for this R equation is that it cancels out. Yeah. So this is what I, this is the balance I avoided doing during the shell balancing. So this is essentially why, because based on all of our assumptions and simplifying assumptions, we're not going to learn anything new because we already essentially solved for VR by assuming that it's zero. Okay. Okay. Well, and note, of course, that this rho vv part, this is how it looks like when your v theta and vr is equal to zero. So this is a tensor, right? And most of the tensor components will cancel out. The only one that is non-zero is not an r component. Okay, so r component of this is zero. 
if I actually do a divergence, R component of it zero because all of the relevant components are zero. So we got that zero is equal to zero. Great. <laughs> After five minutes of canceling terms. So this also shows, so yes, the equation of motion is more general, but it, this also shows that because it's more general and in these relatively simple cases, you have to cancel all of the terms out that sometimes more time consuming than actually doing the shell balance. Now, ultimately, this is the determination that you're going to make for yourself. What is, the, what is the, your preferred method of solution? Okay. So we get 0 is equal to... Well, ultimately, all of these parts are 0, so my solution here is that my pressure doesn't depend on R, but that's something that we kind of inherently assumed, but here I actually proved it. Now, if I go through theta equation, this is a similar procedure. So I'm just this time actually writing everything out to make you aware um, that this is how divergence of tau looks like in the most general sense. Okay. So in this particular case, yes, we can cancel most of the terms, but that doesn't mean the terms are not there. Okay. And this is my row VV. So definitely the theta component of divergence of this is zero. Okay. And I will similarly cancel all of these terms and some of them I already canceled in the previous slide. So basically you will get using this equation that dpd theta is equal to zero. So I don't have theta dependence in pressure. Again, in shell balance, this is something that we assumed, okay, without really proving. Though if we actually went through the balance, we would probably confirm this as well. Not probably, but we would. So what I learned after two slides of canceling the term is that the, this generalized pressure or flow potential is a function of Z. Now we go to the Z equation motion, which will ultimately come down to our uh, Z momentum balance. Okay. So my, great, uh, my divergence of tau Z component, according to appendix A7, is this is its full version. Tau theta Z and tau RZ, these partial derivatives disappear mostly because v theta is and v r are zero or v z doesn't depend on anything else but r. Rho v v is this and this is finally one term that we're going to use. So basically the z component of this divergence is divergence of this last column. Okay, so it's divergence of these terms and then the only thing that survives is why is my okay it's thinking though it's right there something something is about to crash oh boy okay why are you thinking okay I can't move well, then z component of this is equal to zero. I will have that generalized pressure term in there and its z component, okay, which is going to be a, a rather gradient of the flow potential. So basically there will be dpdz term and there will be this term in the equation. When I balance them out, it's going to be precisely the same equation that we're uh, used to and that we can solve for the velocity distribution once my computer gets back to senses. Meanwhile, I'm actually now going to... So basically, by this approach, I arrive, if my computer allowed to show you, <laughs> I arrive at the same velocity distribution that I would expect from shell balance. So now we will actually move on to a different problem. So take one and send the rest up. So since you just went like this,
this with my entire PowerPoint presentation. Let's actually see that you understood what I was saying. <laughs> so give it a chance, because if I saw that you would just be going to like this. And it's a little different than you actually. So basically, it's the similar approach. What we are looking at is quit flow. So I have an outside <laughs> cylinder and an inside cylinder. Okay? And it's just now that I have a theta motion of this outside cylinder. Okay? So my V theta is the velocity that I'm not going to cancel. And all others I'm actually going to assume are zero. So my assumptions going into this is since inside cylinder is static and the outside one is moving, theta direction, I have a natural imposed, boundary conditions are imposing that I'm definitely a function of r, okay? Because I have to meet these boundary conditions. My velocity is zero at the inner cylinder and it's non-zero or maximum at the outside cylinder, okay? So r dependence I cannot cancel. But all of the others, I can. Or rather, I'm assuming that I'm actually looking at this. It's a relatively small vertical section. So my differences due to gravity are not huge. So I'm not going to have, I'm basically going to assume I don't have them. And I'm going to ignore gravity. Because this outside motion is essentially dominant. Okay. I can't always do that, but in this case, I can. So first, I would like you to, there's an assumption number one, that Vt theta is just Vt of, uh, V theta of r, Vr is zero, and Vz is Vz of rz. So I would just like you to practice without assuming that Vz is zero. Let's actually get there step by step. So please apply what equation of continuity on this V theta, V R, and V Z in the first assumption. And let's see if we can get that V Z is actually a function of R as well, based on the equation of continuity. So this is a practice of going and looking up how does divergence of V look like in the book. I might have one extra book. So what you need is a form of divergence of V in cylindrical coordinates. And if my computer allowed you to, okay, I'm going to have to restart while you're working on it. Some boundary conditions that would give me different things for different 
Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So it has some inflow and outflow that would actually force different solutions. But right now, is this, so theta is definitely not there. Now, z could be because they took a gravity, but I decide to say, no, gravity is not dominant here. I'm forcing this in theta direction much stronger than I have. So if I have an order of magnitude difference, I'm not going to care to the first order to solve any differences in the gravity. Does that make sense? Yes. Thank you.